common values, common goals, common sense. The Common Sense Podcast with Semi Bird. All right, all right. Hello, my friends, and welcome back. I think this is episode seven, The Economy. And we're going to go right into questions and, and answers, but I, I want to start off with something. First and foremost, I want to thank everybody. Thank you for your support. Thank you for standing strong. Thank you for standing for liberty, for unity, for standing for common sense, for saying that we're ready to put people over politics. We're not going to be controlled by party politics, by racial, civil, or any other discourse that would divide us. We're going to look to common sense. We're going to look to what we want to see in the future of Washington State. And we know we can't get there unless we unite, unless we come together. And as people are tuning in and lining up their questions, you have to understand, politics, (laughs) it can be very, very negative. I know it. You know it. Anybody who's ever been involved in it knows it. But at the end of the day, You cannot let it control you. You cannot let it consume you. You have to stop and think about why are we doing this? What is the end state? What do we want to obtain? What do we want to attain? What does the future look like? And this is to ensure a future for our children, our grandchildren, and all that who come after us. And so for the last two weeks, we've seen a lot, a lot of negativity. We've had articles posted. We've had people say, Simi, you've got complaints with the state because of this or that, and they're saying you're out of money, and they're saying this, and you're saying that. My friends, it's okay. It's okay. Keep checking the accounts. Keep checking. You're going to see things are going to go up. It's going to go here. It's going. But here's what's going to happen. At the end of the day, we'll be here. We will win the primary. We're going to be in the general election, and there is something wonderful that's going to happen in November of 2024. We're going to take our state back. And in a very positive way. We're not taking the state back for Republicans. We're not taking the state back for Democrats. We're not taking the state back for any party. We're taking the state back for the citizens of Washington State. Again, for our children and for our children's children. Remember while we're in this, I'm going to grab one of my lozengers. Keep this machine lubricated. And we're going to look to the questions on the screen. Hello, everybody. Thank you for tuning in. I've got questions that were written down that I printed off. Get this bad boy going. And we're going to start off from the very beginning, right from the top. What power does the governor have to help Washington State economy be strong and grow? And so here's how I would answer that. I would say a lot of power. And here's why. The Washington State governor sets, establishes the budget for Washington State. And I've adopted this term You know, and I I use it loosely, a a correlative relationship, which means, does the budget of Washington state have anything to do with the economy? I say yes. How we spend our money, how we manage our money has everything to do with our economy, right? How we tax you, how we pass laws, our legislation, our regulation has everything to do with the economy. And so when the governor passes, or excuse me, writes the budget, proposes the budget, it goes to the legislation. The legislation looks at it, reviews it, makes changes, both houses, and then it comes back to the governor. And the governor can do line item vetoes if necessary. And then it needs to go back. And again, the same process until it's agreed upon. So the governor does actually have authority. But again, the governor also has authority in what laws get past the governor's desk. I'll give you an example. And we'll talk about it. The Climate Commitment Act cap and trade, cap and invest. You are paying 50 cents more per gallon for gasoline. You're paying 63 cents more per gallon of diesel. How is that working out in terms of your budget? Does that affect you? Well, of course it does. So as governor, I would have never passed cap and trade, cap and invest, or aka the Climate Commitment Act. Because in a time when we have record inflation, when the economy is at an all-time low, when we have supply chain management issues, when we have an affordable housing crisis, 
why would we further harm the citizens of Washington State by passing laws when people are struggling to put food on the table, to feed their families, to pay their bills? Why would we do that? That's the question. Well, as governor, I would have never done that. And as your new governor, when I take office in January of 2025, I pray that this initiative passes. Because if you don't know, you need to know. There are six initiatives out there that you need to get behind. You need to sign. And one of them is the repeal of cap and trade, the Climate Commitment Act. I hope that initiative passes because if it doesn't, I will do everything in my power to push to repeal it when I become governor. It should have never been there. They sought to penalize fossil fuel industry, but what they're doing is they're penalizing citizens who are struggling to make ends meet. To make ends meet, that's wrong. So we're going to move on to the next question, and I'm going to keep an eye on questions coming this way. I'm going to keep an eye on questions that we have coming this way. And I think I'm seeing it here. My brother, when we, oh, I love this. Thanks, Billy. Love you, bro. Okay. So when will you help or how will you help small business? And I'm still not done in terms of what the governor can do to help and grow a strong economy. So I'm still with you on that question because it, it's a great question. And I'm going to answer that question as I'm answering all these other questions because how can we help small business? So under the executive branch of government, right, we have employment security. We have labor and industries. We have Department of Revenue. We have all these regulatory departments that fall under that branch that have often been weaponized to do more harm to small business than to support small business. Our small businessmen and women are the lifeline of our economy. For example, think about all the people in Washington state that are employed right now. Did you know that 50.7% of all of them are employed by small businessmen and women? That's right. So if you're a small businessman and women out there, thank you for contributing to making Washington State somewhat secure in our economy. There's a lot of work to be done. And so during the COVID crisis, did you notice how L&I was weaponized to go after restaurants and other establishments to shut them down for certain things? That was wrong. Do, do you notice how those those organizations are not elected positions? So the accountability to the citizens of Washington State don't exist. We call that, in terms of understanding self-governance, marble cake. It's all garbled together. It's cooperative federalism. There's no separation there. It's all garbled together. And so as governor of Washington State, it's important for me to understand that these organizations serve the citizens of Washington State. They shouldn't be used against small businesses. Right now with labor and industries, people don't realize the laws are not necessarily written to protect small businessmen and women. There are legitimate issues where a person gets injured on a job, and that person should be protected. But there are a lot of cases where someone will claim an injury on the job. They came to work hurt. Or you can see them literally doing something reckless and crazy on purpose, but yet the way the law is written and the way it's enforced, the business is guilty no matter what. And whether that employee is faking it or not, that business is still liable. We have to relook at that. We protect our workers. We, we have to. But we also have to protect our small businessmen and women. How about our B&O tax? How we're taxing our businesses? Right now, we, we tax our businesses based on category. What, what type of business is it? There's a proposition out there to say that we will do it by matrix, meaning what is the, the, the cost of doing, what is their net? And then we'll tax that. That's not how it is. It's by category. We should be looking at better ways. We should be rewriting that so that we're not overtaxing our small men and women business owners. We need to relook at that. There's a lot of things that we have to consider, especially at a time where our economy is at a downfall. Here's the other thing. Have you noticed how many small businesses are closing up and leaving? How many big businesses are closing up and leaving and why? Because we have lawlessness in our streets. Because literally someone can just pull up and defecate in front of a business 
and there's no consequences because someone can just go in, steal whatever they want to, and there's no consequences, no pursuit because we've hamstrung our law enforcement officials. And we talked about this in our law and order podcast. We've talked about it on our website. We have our, our law and order uh, solutions with actions, but there's no accountability. There's lawlessness in Washington state. This is why having a governor that supports our men and women of law enforcement who supports the rule of law is important. That's what we talk about, that correlative, right? That correlative effect. If we have lawlessness, it's going to affect small businesses, large businesses, our economy, and our citizens. I hope that makes sense to you. And so we're going to hold our government agencies accountable in terms of having a mindset of service and not a mindset of our small business men and women are somehow targets. We're not going to play that game anymore. We're here to serve. It's a different mindset. And let's talk about the CARES Act. This is that that proposition that we're going to pay into this, this concept that at the end of the day, when we retire, we'll have money that we can go into long-term care and we'll have money that'll take care of us. That's just not true. I think the max is just, just over $36,000 max. That's all in. And if you leave the state, you lose all that anyway. And so the burden that that puts on to go through that process, the juice isn't worth the squeeze. It's literally a hardship on our citizens and on our businesses. And then think about the accountability. It's not worth it to do it. How about the capital gains tax? We literally, we literally passed an income tax, called it an excise tax. The Superior Court judge said, no, this stops here. It's an income tax. And in Washington state, the Constitution forbids an income tax. But this administration and this attorney general said, no, it's not an income tax, even though the IRS would categorize it as such. It's an excise tax because we say it is. And it went to the Supreme Court of Washington State. And they said, no, we're going to pass it. It is. And now it's going to go to the Supreme Court of the United States. Here's the thing with that tax. It can be enforced if a person has a capital gain outside of the state of Washington. That infringes upon the law that says interstate commerce. That's no bueno. So that is going to go to the state Supreme Court, excuse me, the U.S. Supreme Court. And I predict, like many other frivolous and arbitrary claims by this attorney general, it's going to be overruled and it'll come back and we're going to reverse that. That's something else that's on the laundry list that needs to be repealed once we take office. And so there is so much I can say as we go down this list. But supporting small businesses, minimizing, deregulating, that's the least we can do. And there's a lot more. We'll talk about affordable housing in a moment. I'm going to get through a few more of these questions. I'm going to keep an eye on what's coming across here. Next question. What regulations will or can you cut from small business? Well, I guess I kind of jumped ahead on that. But since we're on it, let's come up with another one or go to another one. Recently, it's become public because of this, again, cap and trade. The cost of natural gas, well, that's going up. So now we're in the cold months, the winter months. They tried to hide the fact that the increase in natural gas, the, the, the increase in, in fuel costs, oil, furnaces, the increase in your, your, your heating costs, they tried to cover that up. But again, they were caught. And now you know that's all because of that cap and trade. Now you know. But that wasn't enough. Now, they're going to rule out natural gas in Washington State, which is going to cost us an additional $9,000. And so, if you're building a house, think about those, those gas fireplaces. Gas heating, cooling. All right, excuse me, gas heating, right? Natural gas appliances. If you're taking those options away the calculated effect is an increase of building costs of $9,000. And where do you think that money is going to be passed to? That's right, the new homeowners. 
So now you're talking an increase of $9,000. Have you looked at the permitting costs recently? The cost of permits. There is so much that we should be looking at to pull back on the regulations that adversely affect our general contractors, our construction companies. You want to talk about affordable housing? Well, let's make housing more affordable to build so that builders don't have to pass those costs on to those homeowners. And when you look at that, when you consider the cost of housing right now, I think it's calculated that you take your annual salary and then you you multiply it times three, and that is typically the cost of a new house when you average it out across the nation. Well, in Puget Sound, in the west side of the state, that's like 6.9%. That's right. In the Puget Sound area, 6.9% of the average salary. The cost of housing is astronomical. And what I'm trying to tell you is this, my friends. We continue to pass legislation. We're doing this to ourselves. And it starts in Olympia with bad laws that adversely affect our citizens. More on that. More on that. You've mentioned tourism before. And how will you help the industry thrive in Washington State? So... Still checking questions that are coming in over here. I want you to understand, I received a, I don't want to say a lot of flack, but I received a a few responses. And and that's okay because that's my job to answer your questions or take heat if I say something boneheaded. And there's a good chance that I will. And I'm I'm fully ready and prepared to take accountability. And if I say or or, or do something that's boneheaded, I'll take accountability. And and I'll, I'll, I'll say it publicly. I'm human. They said, Simi, We have enough people in Washington State. Why are you talking about making Washington State the tourist capital this side of the Mississippi? Well, let me explain that to you. I'm not talking about increasing residency or population because that's also a problem when it comes to affordable housing. Our population continues to increase astronomically. And as noted by the Washington State government studies, the majority, the large part of this issue stems from immigration. Something to consider. And we've talked about it and we'll talk more about that. I'm not talking about residency. I'm talking about tourism. When people come here because it's a beautiful state, because they come here because we are oceanfront. We have the beautiful sound. We have beautiful rivers. We have beautiful mountains. We have beautiful forestry beautiful streams. Washington State is the most beautiful state in the union. People want to come here to visit. That's right. And they come here and they spend their money here. And who benefits? Those small men, those small businesses, those men and women, those small business owners, they benefit. And what happens? They hire people to work in those restaurants, to work in those shops, to work in those stores, to provide those services Tourism, those guides, those awesome kayak, those ocean guides, those river guides. These are jobs. This is prosperity for Washington State. So tourism is a good thing for Washington State. It brings a lot of money. But like I talked about in our law and order, we need to deal with the homelessness. We need to deal with the lawlessness. And then we're going to make Washington State again, that beautiful Emerald City, that people not only want to live in, but people want to come visit? Great question. The film industry, the film industry skips Washington and films in Canada. Will you offer competitive tax breaks to encourage production within Washington State? So that is, that's genius and I like it. And yes, um, you're reading my mind. It's not just for the film industry. So that's kind of tipping my hat, but let's tip the hat. That is a large, or I'll just say, that is a tool that I intend on using to attract more business to Washington State. So the key to growing our economy is to bring in more business, right? To to bring in more industry, but to also to incubate industry within Washington State. Tax incentives are a way to do it. And while we're speaking on taxes, As I'm rambling, sometimes I do it, okay, all the time I do it, 
we should be looking at ways for those who are doing business in Washington State, especially small businesses, reduce taxes to incentivize our local and small businesses so that they can thrive. For example, small veteran-owned businesses, disabled veteran-owned businesses, and I can go on and on and on. Women, minority-owned businesses, and I know we have a great program within Washington State, but the program doesn't go far enough. We need to be going into those communities and educating people, helping them incubate those companies, helping them to understand how to start up the business, how to write a business plan, right? And then lining them up with those bankers to give them those small business loans. Let's set them up for success. But let's also give those new veteran-owned businesses one-year tax-free business ownership. Why? You served your country. You're willing to die for your country. Let's give you a year. Why? Because businesses either make it or break it within their first year. This is that first year that they're building their client base, the first year that they're paying off their equipment, the first year that they're hiring. They're, they're learning, right? They're establishing themselves. This is the time that we want to help. So let's start incubating those small businesses. Let's use those tax incentives to help Washington State businesses. And there's more. It's not just for veterans. I have a lot of programs that I'm going to bring forward. I'll be writing on. I'll be signing. And that way you guys can read them. You don't have to listen to me babble about it. But to the film industry, yes. I was just in beautiful Roslyn, Washington. We did an event last week. Roslyn, they filmed a TV show in Roslyn, right? And, and, And many of you know the show. I don't want to get a complaint by mentioning this show on air. So we're going to be cautious about that. But they filmed the TV show right there. They should still be filming TV shows in Washington State because it's so beautiful. So why would we not attract, incentivize, and bring them here? We're going to do that. Again, we're going to clean up the state. We're going to make it safe. And we're going to bring that business to Washington State so that Washington citizens thrive. You bring that business here, And that money is spent on our economy, which creates more jobs, which lessens the burden of taxes on citizens. And I hope that makes sense. That is just a taste of what we can be doing. Taxes. Because right now, the mindset of this administration is to add more taxes. Our budget for 24, 25, we are on a a biennial budget system. So every two years. So this year we passed the budget for 24 and 25, which is over $142 billion, over $70 billion per year. Now, I want you to go back to when this governor was first elected to office. Our budget has doubled. And again, no blame and never disrespect, ever. We should be looking at ways to operate our government more effectively, more efficiently. We call that fiscal responsibility. This is why on day one, I have said, I've written, and I'll say it again. Day one in January, when I take office, I will initiate a third-party audit of all state programs and all state offices. Never to penalize, never to go after, that's ridiculous. It's to give me a baseline understanding of how all of our state programs and offices are performing and how they are working. How is the money being spent? Where is the money going? We call that accountability of performance. Where are the KPIs, the key performance indicators that are measuring how your government is working for you? You deserve that. You deserve to know. And how can we expect you to pay us when we are not using the money that you give us effectively, efficiently. It's wrong. So we're going to change that. Here's what's going to happen, my friends. We are going to save a lot of money. I think you can figure that out. I mean, you can figure that out, whether it was me or any other person running for office, an R, a D, or an I, set take politics out of this. Any governor that comes in office that does a program like this or initiates an intervention like this, you know we're going to find waste and we're going to fix it and we're going to be more effective. We're going to be more efficient and we're going to save a lot of money. That saves you taxpayer dollars. And here's the next thing I'm going to move on. 
tax incentive. We haven't had a tax break in over 40 years. You deserve a tax break. I will initiate, if it's not done yet, and I don't see it in the, in the future over the next year, I will initiate the first tax incentive, the first tax break back to you that we've had in the, in the last 40 years. Why? Because you deserve it. And not just because you deserve it, but because it's long overdue. We are spending too much money. We are spending money recklessly, and we're not utilizing taxpayer dollars effectively and efficiently. So I'm going to check over here. I want to make sure that I'm not missing any questions. And guys, just keep typing it in case I miss it, because I don't want to miss anything. Um, what, what do you consider a small business? So small business. So Lena, and this is Lena Coleman. Lena's small business definition, there's, there's two definitions. If you go by Federer, 150000 or less, it's different defi definitions. State has a definition also. So you have small business, and then you have micro, micro business. So I'm going to yield to our state definition of small business, and then I would direct you to our Washington State website for small business operations. It gives you all that information. It also will spell out micro business and define that for you as well. And so when we talk about small businesses, it's typically a certain amount of employees. Okay, there's your, there's your category in terms of separating out large and small businesses. One thing that I read into your question that I think it bears um, explaining because I think my answer was kind of eh to you. There is a small business of, God, I said 150,000, 10,000. That's a lot of employees. 10 employees, five employees. These are small businesses, two employees. This is what I call small businesses. So supporting people who are entrepreneurs, who have a dream of having a bakery, who have a dream of having a, a bicycle repair shop, who have a dream of having a tutoring service. These are small businesses that I'm talking about. Okay, so when I say small business, it's anyone, whether you have no employees, just you, 10 employees, 20 employees, 150 employees, whatever the state requirement is to satisfy for small business. And then again, the Small Business Administration also has definitions that categorize. So they're all different. But for me, I support anyone who has a dream to start their own business because that's where it starts. And that dream correlates to creating value for others because now you hire someone. Now you're paying taxes. Now you're spending money on your local economy. That is value added. We need to incentivize that mindset. Small business ownership breaks generations of poverty. I know that because I'm not the first small business owner of my family. My aunt Emma is probably the first small business owner. She was a house cleaner, right? And many um, in my family uh, started out that way because that was the jobs that was available for them, housekeeping. My grandfather, who uh, retired out of the Navy, the highest rank he could go was he was a, a, a steward. So he served the captain in the ship. That was the highest rank, but he was proud of it. He was a veteran. He was a naval veteran and a proud naval veteran. But my aunt leveraged that, and she retired, and she was successful. And so I support small business growth. And, and, they, and again, forgive me for the, the lame answer. Um, I'll do better next time. Going down the list, and for the film industry, and I hope I answered that for you, yes, it's not just the film industry. We need to bring more business to, to Washington State. Seattle used to be cool. Now my family avoids it. Um, what will you do to make Seattle a tourist destination again? And I kind of spoke with that, spoke to that. Guys, I, again, we need to clean up our streets. We need to make our streets safe again. And, and I hope you see the correlation, the relationship between my policy on law and order my policy on homelessness, mental illness, and addiction, which is all published on my website. And I haven't published my, my policy on the economy. I promise you, today it's just mostly just fellowship and answering questions. Um, that's what today is about. But I'm going to spell it out for you guys. And I will be specific because that's really what I prefer to do instead of just um, having a, a fellowship loosely but I do enjoy that. I will be very detailed and I will sign it as I always do because 
whatever I write down and I sign, that's what I, I, I'm, I'm making a promise to. And if you have any changes you want to that, let me know. And we'll make changes to that. I want you to invest in the future of Washington State. I want our campaign, Burr for Governor, to be a campaign that, that you can get involved in. This is a campaign of the people, by the people, and of course for the people. So get involved, right? This is that David and Goliath story. I was telling my friend this morning when she called, and she was responding to one of those articles, Simi, gosh, I'm getting calls. I'm with you 100%. Someone said that you're out of money. They saw an article, and then this other person from this other campaign who's been talking about your money, this and this and this. And I said, it's okay. It's going to be fine, right? We had a big bill that came in, and we posted the bill because that's what we do. We don't go into debt. We pay them as they come. And so we're here, and now we're here. We're going to be here again. That's just it. So keep looking. It'll go back up. But no, we're not that campaign that came in with all these big names supporting us and all these big money people pouring in all that money. That's not us. Guys, we're, we're just we're a group of people who love our state, who believe in Washington State, who believe in one another, who want unity, who want to break down those barriers, who want to get past party politics, who wants to get past discourse who wants to get past that thing where you say, I'm a Democrat. Oh, God, you're a Democrat. Or I'm a Republican. Oh, you must be a racist. I want to get past that nonsense. I want to get past, I'm a, I'm a citizen of Washington State. I am a citizen of Washington State. You get what I'm saying? I know I'm corny. I sound corny. So I'm coming back over here, right? And, and again, more. Seattle's a, Seattle is a disaster. It's a mess. But you have a plan that'll make it. yes. This is us. It's not just me. This is, this is us, right? We can do this together. We can do it together. And that is what has to happen. It's us sitting aside our differences and looking to common sense solutions. We have to understand when it comes to affordable housing that there are things we can do in terms of not just making housing more affordable to build, by deregulating the cost of building, right? By zoning and adjusting zoning. Instead of saying that you cannot build residential here because this is just for commercial, when there's nothing being done with the land, why don't we open up that space for residential? And why don't we partner with a developer that comes in and says, we'll contract with you, and we'll talk about procurement acquisition and contracting in a minute. We'll contract with you. Washington State will. And we will open it up to bidding, right? So it's fair and impartial. It's a process. We'll contract with you. You put up the costs. You pay for it up front so it's not coming out of Washington State taxpayers, right? You, the developer, you pay for it. And you make a promise under contract that you will keep those costs for rent at this level so it's affordable, but here's the benefit, because I'm a capitalist too. You are going to have a residual income for a long time, and the value of that property will continue to go up, and you will continue to have that money coming in. That residual income contract is worth a lot of money. I'm a real estate investment person. Some of you know that. Some of you don't. I'm telling you now. I have a couple properties. I have a few. So I, too, am a landlord. Not big money. No, <laughs> at all. So it matters for me if a tenant doesn't pay money, right? Because I rely on that. My family does. So I know what I'm talking about. But could we not have contracts like that where we're incentivizing developers to come in to build affordable housing and it's not coming out of our state budget? Because right now in our state budget, I think last time I read $400 million set aside, not to mention for the future billions right? There's better ways to do business. That's what I'm proposing. Better ways to spend taxpayer dollars because it's not taxpayer dollars. It's businesses who are investing because they're going to get the return on investment. That ROI is coming back. So rezoning is one way to look at it. How about incentivizing rural development? Just a concept. I don't have all the answers, but think about this. We have a very big state. 
We have a lot of rural communities out there. And, and don't get me wrong, I don't want any hate mail saying, Simi, do not send businesses to my community. Guys, no. The state stays with the state. I believe in separation of powers. This would have to be an agreement with, with counties, with cities. And the citizens there would say, well, do we want more jobs? Do we want this company to come here and bring 500 jobs to, to our community? If the answer is yes, then can the state bring a tax incentive and recruit recruit technology or any other business to come give them a home in this county, in this community? And the community has already said, put us on that list. We will welcome them. We will welcome their money. We will welcome their jobs. We will welcome that tax base to our community. And then guess what? Now, those that congestion relocates from here and goes over here. I'm just putting that out there. And while we're talking about congestion, and I don't want to sit here and just ramble, I'm hoping that you're getting some value and kind of hearing how my mind works. It's a mindset. It's a mindset. My mindset is not to tax you. My mindset is to partner with businesses, large and small, to create value for you, our citizens. That is my mindset. Not to take your money and then use it for programs that really don't work, that cause more heartache and pain for you. And then what do we do? Ask you for more money because that's what's been happening. You know it and I know it. It's not working. I'm bringing forth a business alternative, a better alternative. So we talked about zoning. We talked about partnering with, with businesses. We were talking about zoning. We were talking about congestion. Are, are you aware that when it comes to our Department of Transportation, we used to have a strategic plan, and we'll talk more about strategic planning. That, that's something that's near and dear to me, as many of you know. It, it's my, my kind of my area. We used to have a, a, a growth plan, a strategic plan that kind of laid out what is needed, what is what do we what do, what do we have, what programs we're going to be work projects we're going to be working on over the next five years, and what are the costs base, and how will it offset congestion, et cetera, et cetera. We haven't been doing that for well over a decade. Last time I checked, it was like 16 years. We haven't had that strategic plan. We haven't seen it. Think about this. When's the last time you saw a strategic plan for Washington State? I haven't seen it. And 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 if you guys know that Washington State actually has a strategic plan, would you please put it on here? Um, because I haven't seen a strategic plan. And I, I've Googled. I've looked. I have not seen it. So if you guys can Google while I'm on, on the air, we're live, let me know. I've looked. I could not find a strategic plan. If you do not have a strategic plan, identifying those strategic objectives of key objectives that must must be addressed and then operational goals, things that you must do to adjust those key objectives, then what are we working towards, right? If you don't have a vision of what you aspire for the state and you don't have a plan to get there, what are we doing? I mean, I wouldn't invest in something or any organization that didn't have a plan. And anybody who's been a small businessman or a large businessman or woman, you can't get a business loan without having a business plan. So why should it be different for the state? Where's our business plan for Washington State? I saw a question and someone asked, Simi, where do you live? I live in Richland, Washington. I was raised in Seattle, Washington. So I live in Eastern Washington. I was raised in Seattle, Washington. Um, let's see here. I, I think I saw another uh, question. I want to make sure I'm getting these questions. And we have, a, we have a few. I won't drag this out, you guys. I don't want to bore you. I want you to get something out of it. And again, I won't take it personal if you're saying, okay, Sammy, I learned what I want, what I needed to learn. I'm out. Let me see. What's your take on last year's bill? Let me see. State goal of stopping gas-powered vehicles. Oh, yeah, production by 2030. So, oh, my goodness, you guys. Okay, so you had to ask. So this, this came from uh, Carrie. Carrie, thank you. And Carrie, that's, that, that's a great question. So Carrie asked pretty much, this is the proposal. Um, and, and Governor Inslee tried. Um, so this was a proposal to go to eliminate fossil fuel vehicles and, and go to electric. This has been, this is part of the climate change concept. And I'm going to be nice with that um, because that's how we should be, right? Respectful of people's different beliefs. 
Um, mine is different in that we protect our environment. Washington State is beautiful. I will always protect Washington's environment. We will also always be ecologically conscious, North American model for wildlife conservation, just putting that out there for my hunters and anglers. Um, but we will always protect our environment. Hydroelectricity, right? 65.6% percent of our electricity comes from hydroelectricity we will continue to expand we will never touch the dams you deserve to know that where i stand right and we know that the federal government is now getting involved in our state government business and, and there's much more to say about that okay so not with this governor no because that hydroelectric power is carbon free and i thought we can all agree that that was a good thing apparently but why not portable nuclear but let's go to the question at hand. Electric vehicles cost $60,000 on average per vehicle. And today we're talking about the economy. How many people can afford a $60,000 car, especially in an economy like this? And again, you hear me mention this a lot. People living at or below the poverty line. And that's probably because much of my, my young life was living at or below the poverty line. And so, yes, call it a bias, if you will. But I think whenever we can lift our citizens out of poverty... That's a good thing for every citizen, and that's just common sense because now they're taxpayers. Now they're taking part of the American dream. Everybody benefits from that. So why would we impose more hardship by saying that we are going to say by this day, which essentially is seven years from now, all of your fossil fuel vehicles go away. We're all electric. Oh, by the way, it just came out the other day that it was a trillion dollar uh, federal program, 500 billion that was dedicated to the electric vehicle charging station infrastructure, right? Was that what was just talked about the other day when, when they, were, they were saying, well, how are we progressing on that $500 billion electric vehicle charging station infrastructure within the nation? And how many have we built? Not one, not one. And our administration within Washington State had set goals for how many state vehicles would be all electric. And the last time I checked, they failed to meet every single one of those goals as well. So there's a pattern. So what am I saying? Electric vehicles, which, by the way, the investments are going down in that. Why? Because the desire is going down. Why? Because maybe people are finding out that to, to produce the elements for the batteries of the batteries, which are built in China, which further enriches China, cobalt being mined in the slave labor of children in the D Democratic Republic of Congo, not so democratic. You see where I'm coming from. We don't have the infrastructure for that. And if you're living in Okanagan County, if you're living in Pond Ray County up in Medellin, I know I'm saying that wrong. They corrected me many times when I was there in Middle Line, right? You don't have the infrastructure. It's going to impose a hardship in our county. It doesn't work. Don't do it. It's only going to impose more hardship on the citizens of Washington State. So I hope, Carrie, I, I answered your question. The answer is no and absolutely no. And if you understand in terms of and I do, I see the huntsman up there. Yes, you know, you know where I'm at. And I'm still with you guys, 100%. Um, I've said this before, I'll say it again. Those windmills, stop and do some research. The cost of installation, the cost of maintenance. And if they ever have to, it's, you're not getting the return on investment. And how many birds do they kill? Oh my goodness. Where are all the animal activists? Where's PETA on that? We're not getting the return on investment. If we were, then I would probably be an advocate, right? If the citizens of that community signed up for it. But we're not getting the return on the investment. I'm all for renewable energy. Let's do it right, right? But hey, portable nuclear. Let's start there. It's plentiful. It's safe. It's carbon free. And it's going to enrich Washington State. And we're going to bring it. So, you know... A, what it, someone said electric is good in vehicles and it's growing and it's effective. Okay. Um, Lena, if, if, if you believe that I we're, we're on two different sides, um, enjoy your electric vehicle. And I mean, I think they're cool because they're quiet, right? And they, they kind of sneak up on you, but, um, you should have that right. You should be able to, to be able to buy one. 
you should be able to, to have a place where you can charge it. So I support you 100% on it. I guess, Lena, what I would say um, as your governor is I support you in this 100%. I'm not giving a platitude. I really mean that. I'm just not going to impose a regulation that takes something away from citizens because other citizens says, we want this, when I know that we don't have the infrastructure right now. But in the future, if we did, in the future, if it was affordable, in the future, if we, if it made sense, then let's talk. I, my mind is, I'm always, I'm learning, I'm listening, always growing forward. So I'm always willing to listen and I'm always willing to learn. Um, and again, I'm not sure if someone said something. Oh my goodness. So Lena's not a fan of nuclear. It sounds like, so Lena, I don't think you're liking my nuclear. I, how do you feel about hydroelectricity? That, that would be my question for you. Um, cause she said, um, people kill ourselves with nuclear. I'm so I'm, I retired from the United States department of energy and, um, no, we're not respectfully. No, um, nuclear submarines, uh, nuclear aircraft carriers, there's a lot of very, very safe nuclear. And by the way, it's um, it's carbon-free. So keep those things in mind. Keep those things in mind. It's it's not the way it used to be, right? So no zombies, no uh, no apocalypse. We're we're good. And so um, and and the I guess the good news is we just need to educate people, right? We don't know what we don't know, and certainly I'm probably one of that. And you're right, hydroelectric is the way to go. And I know that in Goldendale, there's a great project um, where we're expanding upon a hydroelectric uh, technology. I'm going to stick around for a few more questions on, on the economy um, in case you guys have anything else to, to add. Um, I do appreciate your, your feedback here. Um, I do want to touch on, on a, a few issues as we talk about the economy. I guess what, what I would say is as I'm reading, um, ah, we got another question. Um, someone says, where is he reading those comments from another platform? I don't see them. Um, he's reading. So that is, oh, D. Hi. D, these are from our, our Gmail. So we have an option. We get questions that come in either here on the thread or we get, ah, and D, you may be, D, I think you're on one platform. So this is what's neat. Guys, and you don't see this. My team, uh, my friend Jack, we have this tool, and, and it's called, I don't want to advertise for another company, um, Restream. So we are now streaming live to Facebook, Rumble, uh, YouTube, and Twitter. And so all those questions that comes in on those different platforms comes to this window that I'm seeing. So yeah, we have this, and Dee, I know you knew about this one, forgive me. But I'm also getting live. So wherever you're at, um, D, yeah, you won't see the other ones because I'm getting them in from different platforms. I hope that makes sense. Cool. And uh, yeah, what else do we have? Da -da. Thoughts on uh, <laughs> pay by the mile driving tax. Um, I want to be unbiased. My first thought is absolutely not. Again, my friends, honestly, if you want to pay more taxes, you know, I, I would be open to a Washington State donation box or something like that. Um, if you just want to give your money away, I, you have to forgive me. My answer is no. I think the role of government, besides protecting and maintaining your individual rights and protecting your civil liberties, is to run our government more effectively, more efficiently, and to give tax relief back to you. It sounds crazy, but but consider this. My mindset is to enrich Washington State. My mindset, and I'm glad I just said that because it's triggering what I really need to talk about in my last few minutes. My mindset is to enrich the citizens of Washington State. And as we're saying that, well, Simi, how might you do that? That was the trigger. Jobs, trades, that is it. We should be talking more about it. And if my voice went loud, it's because I got excited. I mentioned it before in other platforms, and I think I did on my education platform that I've written and I've signed. It starts in middle school with mentorship programs, but certainly in high school, freshman year, which what I call my our junior apprenticeship program. And people are, you know, those students are working in the summertime, right, and earning credits. 
right? And then when they graduate with job placement, they have good paying jobs. Trades is the answer, not just college. Trades, good paying jobs and incentivizing more companies that facilitate those good paying trade jobs, certifications, amazing certifications in cybersecurity, technology. This is the way of the future, not simply the traditional route of a four-year degree. And, and I'm glad that someone wrote something there that triggered that for me because what I want to do is I want to incentivize and support trades in Washington State and those good-paying jobs. Labor is the way to go. Trades, right? Technology and facilitating that. And here's the other thing. I've said it before. I'm going to say it again and probably a million more times. I wrote something called a meritocracy. This is based on the work of my childhood hero and role model, Dr. Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. The concept is to lift people out of poverty and despair because Dr. King fought and died for equality of opportunity. And his march in Washington, it was for jobs and freedom because a good paying job is freedom. That I believe is truly, when we talk about economy, we have to talk about jobs. That's how you enrich people, enrich their minds, enrich their hearts with the, that, that freedom of having that trade, that freedom of having that good paying job. That is something that's almost like teach them how to fish, right? And they'll feed themselves for a lifetime. That is a direct correlation in my mind. Give them that trade and that certification and, and they can thrive throughout their life, right? And, and that has a direct correlation to my programs in prison reform. I want people to come out of incarceration better than the way they went in. I want, I want, to, I want to revive. I, I want to, well, there's so much we can do. I am about lifting people out of poverty and despair and never giving up on anyone. Trade schools, yes, that is the way to go. Let's support that. Let's sponsor that. And I just saw that beautiful hands up. God bless those who lost their lives um, in the attack on Pearl Harbor. December 7th, right? That day which will live in infamy. If we cannot learn from wars of the past, if we cannot learn and, and understand that those who pay the ultimate sacrifice so that we can enjoy the freedoms that we enjoy every single day, then what does that say about us as a society today? I'm, I'm going to build upon that as, as we close out today. Politics, party, race, this is America. America was always intended to be better than any other place on the planet. It really was. And I believe that. Call me foolish. Call me idealistic. Call me whatever you want because, trust me, people are calling me all kinds of things already. I believe in the essence of America that everyone has a home here. Regardless of your race, your creed, your color, or religion, you deserve love, you deserve respect, you deserve compassion, you deserve empathy. I believe in that. And then going back to those men and women who fought for and died for America, who served their nation, this country is worth fighting for. And when I say worth fighting for, it's worth believing in. It's worth loving one another. It's worth not giving up on one another. It's, it's worth saying, you know what, Semi Bird, you know, maybe you were only a school board director, right? Maybe I didn't like that you voted to give choice when it came to masking of children because of the high suicide rate. Maybe, maybe I don't like your position on critical race theory because you opposed it because you believe that any person, regardless of color, can achieve the American dream. That no one is born flawed. That everyone has value. You may not like what I stand for. But if you knew my heart, you would know that I stand for you. You would know that I love you. You would know that if you were struggling, I would lift you up. And so to that, I guess what I would say is as I end this, I encourage everyone to get to know me because if you know me, here's what you'll know. I will never give up. I will never quit. 
I will never stop loving or believing in America. And because I love and I believe in America, because I, with all of my heart, I was willing to die for this country. And so when you think about it in that perspective, I'm not going to quit this calling to serve as your next governor. I can't. I won't. And I will be here in August of next year. We will be here together. Because believe it or not, there's enough of us who do believe in America. There's enough of us who want to bring change. There's enough of us who believe in the greatness of what this country has always intended to be. We don't care about party. We don't care about that partisanship. We're about truth, love, the Constitution, and that concept of a melting pot and coming together, making this beautiful state everything that it can be, and better, and better. And we do that together. And I may not have all the answers. I may not have all the answers. But that's okay. That's okay, because I've got you. We will do this together. And if you believe as I believe, go to Bird for Governor. Dot com. Go to birdforgovernor.com and donate. Guys, again, I've already told you, I'm not quitting. I'm not going anywhere. You're stuck with me. And so there's no reason not to invest in this amazing experience of we the people. There's no reason not to have hope on what can be because we are going to make history. Not just history in Washington State. We are making national history in Washington State. It's not me, it's we. And know this, I am not fighting against anyone. I'm fighting for everyone. United we stand, together we can. Let's make history together. God bless you guys, and we'll see you next week. I don't know what I've got planned. I, I do know, ah, I do know that I'm going to be in um, Clallam County, Um, And I'm going to be in Forks. I'm going to be in Port Angeles. It's going to be in the 9th. Um, I do know that Clark County is going to have their Christmas social also in the 9th. Clark County, thank you for the love you've given me. Uh, Eastern Washington, you know what? I said this. Spokane County endorsed me, and I know I have a few more minutes. Spokane County endorsed me um, some months ago, and and I was talking about all the the western side of the state counties that, that have endorsed us. And I didn't mention uh, Spokane. God bless you guys. You know what? You guys stood by me. Second largest city in, in the state. Your power players. I mean, everyone. A Soton. Come on now. A Soton. Right? Thank you for standing up. Whitman, you stepped up. I remember the love you guys gave me. Right? Um, Columbia County. And I, I would give a shout out to the most amazing general hospital, rural county in the state. I'm one of the best CEOs, some of the best nursing staff, um, hospital staff in the state. I don't want to, I don't want to cause any heartache or violate any, any rules, but, uh, uh, Shane and and staff, you know, I love you guys to this day. Um, keep serving your patients. Um, and, and just guys, thank you. Thank you for your love. Thank you for believing in, in our mission. Everybody, thank you for your donations. Um, my team out of Enumclaw. You're the wind in my sails. Guys, I can thank everybody. I can't. Kids have, I can't thank everybody. You know I love you guys. And don't, <laughs> King County, Pierce County, oh, I know who you are. We're here together, and you are making a difference. And, um, yeah, let's do this thing. See you guys.